Welcome back everyone, Kostin here with my tier list for Total War Warhammer 3, Immortal Empires, Legendary Lords. We're moving on to B tier, we've already covered S and A tier, so these are the Lords as I see them right now in the game at the moment based on their campaigns, their strength, uh, just everything, how it all plays together. It's not enough from my perspective to just have a huge amount of power if like the terrain around your campaign is completely terrible or your campaign just sucks. Either way, moving on to B tier, the first one it is going to be Arkan the Black. Now while I certainly don't necessarily have a, a high opinion of the Tomb Kings, Arkan is a pretty powerful legendary lord. And while his campaign may get pretty boring as you are going to steamroll completely out of control fairly quickly, it is fun to play the Tomb Kings in quite a lot of ways. It is fun to play a faction or a race that just has disposable armies. The problem in Tomb Kings campaigns though for the most part is the fact that their early game situation is very, very limited. It made sense in Warhammer 2 where, you know, having a full stack of units for, let's say, 15 turns was not really too much of an issue. But in Warhammer 3, it is a major issue. But Arkhan does have a lot of advantages to overcome that. In the sense that he starts with an extra army from the very beginning and he has a bunch of unique units. I'd say he's a bit too strong at the moment in the sense that between the unique units he gets in his campaign as well as the starting extra army he's just going to completely obliterate his opposition but certainly can be a very fun and enjoyable campaign if if you're up for it then we have Tarox, the Brass Bull, for the Beastmen. I don't necessarily think the Beastmen right now as a race as a whole are in a great spot in the sense that right now Warhammer 3 is all about the early game. It's not necessarily so much about like past turn 40, 50, and the Beastman early game can suffer a significant amount, especially for Tarox. He has a fairly difficult starting position, though they have made it easier with the recent uh, pat with some of the recent patches. Here's the thing, though: if you do overcome that difficult early game and you start getting regiments of renown and you start getting the more powerful units, you have a campaign that has a huge amount of potential in it. You just have to overcome the initial challenges, deal with things like Silostra, Leaf and R, etc. But if you manage it, and it is a pretty big if, I imagine, for a lot of people, then you certainly will have a blast of a campaign where you're just gonna fight a lot of battles every single turn. I would not necessarily recommend this campaign for people um, that don't enjoy fighting a lot of battles manually because that's exactly what you should be doing in this campaign fighting a lot of battles manually every single turn to maximize the potential that you do have uh, then we have Skarsnik B tier as well it says a lot about Skarsnik that the greenskins are one of the best races in the game at the moment that he's a B tier legendary lord but he's kind of pathetic the problem is that while he has a major goblin benefit in terms of upkeep though he doesn't have the goblin tide skill line himself which is actually a pretty significant downside because without the goblin tide your nasty skulkers have significantly less armor you want to use nasty skulkers and so because of that situation you're going to end up being far more limited in terms of um, in, in terms of like his own army potential. But yeah, you can recruit a, a bunch of goblin uh, gray shamans as lords and give them the goblin tide. They'll actually do better in battle than Skarsnik will because of the extra armor. They're going to give the goblin archers and the nasty skulkers, not night goblins to be uh, specific. I think night goblins could use that benefit at the moment. At least their melee units could because there's virtually no reason to use them in a campaign at the moment. Uh, but here's the problem in Skarsnik's campaign. While he certainly can dominate in the early game, he's going to have a lot of issues in the late game. The reason he's going to have a lot of issues is simply because he can only recruit orc units from Karak 8 Peaks. And it's not like, oh, you take Karak 8 Peaks, you get uh, orc recruitment. If that was the case, Skarsnik would be much higher on this uh, tier list. No, you can only recruit uh, orc units from that particular settlement. And... It's a settlement in a province with two regions. While Greenskins have a lot of recruitment capacity in general, uh, they do require a decent number of regions, like three, four regions in a province in order to fully utilize that. 
whereas Carrick Eight Peaks, it's in a province with only two settlements, so it ends up being fairly limited as a result of that in terms of unit recruitment. And the structure that allows you to recruit um, orc units takes a long, long time to build, which is an anomaly for the Greenskins because they generally build things very fast and very cheap, not so much for Skarsnik's orc recruitment. And not being able to recruit orcs does cause a lot of issues in the long term of your campaign because while Nasty Skulkers are great in the early game for like 30, 40 turns, they stop being as useful much like they're on as you're encountering much better units in a campaign. So you do need the orc units. Like, the Greenskins have great unit variety. Skarsnik just has less unit variety in his campaign because he can only recruit orc units from that one settlement. And he's not a great male factor. His faction effects, like, basically, it just boils down to the major upkeep benefit that he does have for goblins. Everything else is kind of meaningless in a lot of ways. Uh, then we have Manfred. Uh, Manfred is a vampire count's legendary lord that basically has no faction effects outside of the books of Nagash. The problem with that is the books of Nagash suck. The entire system sucks. Say what you will about the Tomb Kings, they're not reliant on the books of Nagash to have faction effects, whereas Manfred does. So Manfred has a fairly limited campaign. He has a difficult starting position. He's surrounded by enemies. He doesn't even have a special uh, a, a lord skill line. He just has two different schools of magic. It's like, okay, that's great. Uh, how about some faction effects like Vlad and Isabella do, or Gorst does, or Kemmler does? Nope, Manfred doesn't have that. He he is basically playing a generic uh, lord for the vampire counts. He is designed to be the generic lord. I guess he, in a lot of ways, he's the ultimate generic lord in the sense he had literally is as bland as you can imagine him. He's also a despicable character in the lore for many, many reasons, but... While I certainly think the Vampire Counts always have a lot of potential in their campaigns, Manfred is just the worst campaign at the moment for the Vampire Counts, at least if you're looking at world domination. Look, say what you will about Gorst. It's, his zombie playstyle sucks, but you don't have to play with zombies if you don't want to as Gorst. It makes sense to play as, with zombies, or you can do a combination of units. Like you get some zombies, you get some Grave Guard, and it ends up working pretty well in your campaign. And Gorst has other benefits outside of the zombies, believe it or not. Because he ultimately is an Necromancer. Manfred doesn't really have anything except the Books of Nagash. And as I stated, the Books of Nagash has a system just to suck. Then we have Xiao Ming of Grand Cafe. Xiao Ming is a pretty powerful Legend Lord. He gets an armor bonus faction wide, so he does better in Ultra Resolve. He gets a caravan bonus, so he's going to earn more money. He's in a pretty good uh, campaign situation overall. Uh, he does have a lot on offer. He does. Uh, he also gets a diplomatic relations benefit with Greece's effectively through his Lord's Skyline. So he's just a better campaign to play than his sister in every way possible, given the current meta. In Realms of Chaos, this was exactly the opposite, but that was mainly due to the fact that Zia, uh, Miao Ying's AI couldn't handle this, the fact that Snake Gate, uh, Snake Gate was open and the uh, invasion of demons and Norskins that were coming through the Great Bastion. So playing his campaign was much more difficult in Realms of Chaos and far more limited, but that situation has been reversed. Playing his campaign right now is just much easier and better in a significant number of ways than Miao Ying. And he just will end up having ridiculous levels of armor on his units in their army, which does help a great deal. Uh, then we have Rapunz, the Leoness for Bretonia. Bretonia is kind of one of those weird races in the game in the sense that they have a lot of things to like. They have a great economy, good growth, actually one of the highest, if not the highest growth, rates in the game they can get, earn a lot of money for sacking and looting settlements they have good uh, hero options limited as they are but they are still pretty powerful their cavalry is the best in the game they have early game artillery so what's not they're not to like well their infantry and range line sucks in a fairly significant amount and bretonia does struggle in sieges that's why bretonia is a limited faction but her pants actually is in a pretty powerful uh, situation. Uh, she's not limited in terms of confederation with other Bretonian factions the way every other Bretonian legendary lord is. She has a special research tree. As a result of that, she can confederate normally, which actually ends up working far better than it does in every other Bretonian campaign. 
She also has a really good starting position, which is fairly well protected from various threats, especially if you deal with Arkhan pretty quickly and make an alliance with the Dwarves, who the Dwarves, minor factions in general, aren't great allies, but Dwarven factions do make for great allies in a campaign, just because the Dwarven army is incredibly powerful and the AI does get benefits. Even if it's a minor faction, it still gets benefits. So we're looking at uh, the minor door faction you start ne next to will have like two full stacks of units that will do pretty well and they will help you out in your campaign. Uh, then we have Miao Ying of Grand Cafe. She just has a worse campaign, less money, a worse starting situation, worse like in, in every way. Like Nan Gao might seem a great situation, but look at Xiao Ming. Xiao Ming literally... Um, starts with the barracks and minor settlement which is the ideal scenario because while it's as defensible it's like you have building slots for the provincial capital Miao Ying starts with her with her barracks and the provincial capital in Nangao and the Nangao province is not as good as Yao Ming just far more lim a far more limited situation also Miao Ying suffers because you might have to go over the Great Bastion to deal with the chaos factions though you may not have to but it is annoying to have village run around the mountains more to attack you in the side when you're when you're trying to deal with Loki and Snitch. That can happen for Xiao Ming as well, absolutely. But I would just say Miao Ying at the moment is worse off than her brother in a campaign. Like she just doesn't get that armor benefit, that caravan benefit, lots uh quite a few issues. Though it shouldn't be noted Cafe is in the trouble spot in the sense that they don't have great replenishment, the compass sucks, and the climate suitability that they have in a campaign is fairly limited. Uh, then we have uh, the Fae Enchantress. Now, the Fae Enchantress, if you're going to play a Bretonian campaign in Bretonia, I would certainly recommend the Fae Enchantress versus Luan Luan Kor. It's not because she's better than Luan, she's not, but Luan's starting position is far, far worse than hers. Like, you'll constantly get attacked by Bellacor. Whereas she might have to deal with Snitch, sure, and Grom, but believe it or not, she is quite capable of doing it. She gets extra peasants from the very beginning, she gets units of Grail Guardians, she has good relations with the Wood Elves. Those are all advantages that do end up working pretty well in her campaign. There are certainly problems, she's still limited in Confederation, etc. But I would say, like, if you're playing a Bretonian campaign in Bretonia, she's the one I would recommend. Then we have Albrecht. I want to like Albrecht. A lot of people don't, for obvious reasons. And I understand exactly why. Like, going on a Knight's Crusade as Bretonia might seem like a great idea. Rapunzel has a Crusader campaign. Except the problem is, Albrecht, to get his quest weapon, has to go for Sartosa. And then he is limited in terms of his diplomacy. And navigating Lustria is always an issue because it's slower and you have a lot of factions and you have a it's still kind of a thunderdome there though it is one dominated by the Lizardmen at the moment but still lots of issues over there and you're gonna have to choose in your campaign who are you gonna ally you can ally Mar Marcus Wolfhard though then enjoy fighting Hexoatl, Gorak and the Cult of Sotek that's a fun experience I gotta tell you um but yeah Bretonia I don't think is well, so that all for the kind of jungle warfare that Lustria has to offer. Though, Albrecht's campaign can work and he can get the vows unlocked pretty quickly, which is a benefit that Rapunzel also has. One of the problems in Bretonian campaigns is actually unlocking the vows for lords and heroes. Well, because you're in a jungle, you can actually do that easier because it's the second vow that's generally the problem because you need to win a siege in a desert or a jungle. Guess where you are? You're in a jungle. Then we have Tretch, Craventel of the Skaven. Tretch is not awful, but he's the worst of the Skaven legendary lords. Skaven are a pretty good race, lots of potential, lots of early game aggression. Tretch just buffs Storm Vermin and Skaven slaves. And oh, he gets Vanguard deployment for a race that has significant Vanguard deployment benefits for a lot of its units. Ooh, yay, that's great. I mean, I guess you can move the artillery closer to the front line. It just doesn't end up working as well as you might think. I mean, you can play a campaign at Strange and you can certainly win it, but like compared to every other Legendary Lord of the Skaven, yeah, Tretch is far, far behind. And I say this as someone who has played this campaign. People wanted me to play this campaign. I've played it. 
he is still an awful, it is still an awful campaign. You, you can't make it work, but you can make any campaign work if you so desire. Like, just compared to all of them, even despite all the issues that Kekla and Frat have in terms of their initial starting positions, their campaigns end up working significantly better than Tretch's does. And besides, you're not constantly getting nuked in all the other Skaven campaigns, whereas in Tretch's campaign you are. There is kind of a bit of bug with his faction benefit with the declaration of war, because you can basically have it perpetually on, but even then it's not as big of a benefit to make it worth it, I would argue. Uh, then we have Lewin, Leon Kerr as Bretonia. Like, Lewin is great to confederate because he's really powerful in battles. He starts with all the vows unlocked, so you don't have to worry about that, etc., etc. But actually, playing Lewin, not worth it. Um, his faction effects are not great. His starting position is pretty bad. Corona as a special settlement actually has less growth than a random generic settlement of Bretonia. It's just the worst campaign to deal with as Bretonia in a very significant number of ways, like constantly getting attacked by Norskans and Belakor from the north, having to deal with Grom, having to deal with Musulan, it ends up being a fairly awful situation, and you're just incredibly limited in terms of this campaign as a result of it. You can make it work, but I would not recommend playing a Bretonian campaign as low, and it just ends up working pretty badly. And then we have Gorak of the Lizardmen. Well, I certainly think the Lizardmen are a weak race and have quite a few issues, Gorok just works. As for why he works, well, nuclear weapon with uh, Lord Croak. There's nothing more to say, really. Well, there is more to say. He is insane in defense. He His Saurus get barrier. That That's pretty crazy. No, all of his units can get barrier on the defense of it. It's, it ends up being pretty damn ridiculous. He is unkillable, and he has a guy who can do AoE. Like, you can literally take Gorok and Lord Croak in a battle and decimate entire legions of forces because of the deliverance of Itza combined with the Legendary Lord that simply can't be killed very easily. So yeah, Gorok, it can be a fun campaign, even though Lizardmen aren't the greatest race to play at the moment. They're, they work, but limitations. Then we have Teclas. Teclas, I guess the kindest thing I could say about Teclas is if you want to play a campaign where you basically have no faction effects, go play Teclas because that kind of feels like it. Or if you just want to play a really powerful caster but with no special faction effects, play Teclas because that's essentially it. I mean, Teclas is a pretty powerful caster, though he's more about spamming spells as opposed to having like something like the Flames of Asgore or other incredibly powerful spells like the Deliverance of Itza. It does work, but like right now, Teclas is the worst High Elven campaign, and honestly, the one I wouldn't... Like, if people are asking me, oh, which High Elven camp campaign should I play? Like, I would get a list off a number of reasons why you should play every single one of them, except Teclas. Teclas' campaign is absolutely not worth playing. The only reason I'm not ranking him lower is that he's still pretty decent, and he's still a High Elven Legendary Lord. Like, it's literally the race that keeps him in the game. And that's it with the B uh, tier Legendary Lords for Total War or Hammer Free, Immortal Empires. Stay tuned for more. Moving, we're going to be moving on to C next time.